cool. So thanks for uh, thanks for hosting this morning. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Clay Stoneman with Palo. I've been here for three years. I work one to one with Trent Steele. I see some of my customers on the line now. Um, excited to be a part of the webinar series uh, that EITS is hosting as we further uh, introduce uh, the best practices around Palo and optimizing your investment for our end users. Um, one of the things that Trent and I ran into three years ago when we came onto Palo uh, is the fact that we walked into a lot of our customers' environments and realized that you know, they, they purchased a, an investment and from an optimization perspective, um, you know, we were spending a lot of time with our customers around, you know, best practices, you know, how you apply control uh, in putting, putting strategy, strategies together for our end users. I think one of the great things that, that EITS has done and put a lot of man hours into um, is really focusing on, you know, how, how do you do, how do you apply control, right? What is, what does decryption mean to an organization? How do you put that type of strategy in place? Um, because it's, uh, the, you know, the BPA, um, you have dials that you can turn. Some of them are easier and some of them are more difficult and, you know, take a consultative approach and have business outcomes associated with them, right? Um, and, you know, one of the things that EITS has done in, in a couple of my accounts is, is, is really come in, held the customer's hand, and walk them through what decryption looks like, you know, what the effects are, um, and, you know, how it relates and correlates to, you know, environments such as PKI, right? And then at the end of the day, uh, as you start applying these controls, you're able to be able to pull heat maps um, and basically have a progress report as to how you're optimizing your current investment. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to deliver metrics back to the business, right? Uh, and if you're successful in showing optimization, applying the control, coming together with a, a strategy around, you know, how to apply decryption to your environment, and then you're delivering metrics back to your business, that's success in my mind, right? And so uh, one, of the, um, one of the investments that EITS has made, and Carl Frey is hosting today, he's put a ton of man hours into, you know, building a practice around what decryption looks like and how he makes it successful for you know, for our customers. So excited to join today. Um, great partnership. Uh, really looking forward to the message, Carl, and, and we appreciate what you do. Turn it yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Wow, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, good to take this time to talk with you guys. Um, um, a lot of material to go through today. Um, some of this is um, in addition to what we went through in our last webinar when we talked about SSL decryption, right? So this is to augment it from the standpoint of a precursor. You know, this is the planning part, um, focusing around uh, PKI, okay? All right, so uh, PKI is, um, it, again, it, it's, it's the precursor, it's the cryptology, it's the public key infrastructure, okay? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to read off. Typically, I don't like to read off, um, you know, definitions right off the bat, but I want to give you the, the 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 canned answer from Wikipedia what PKI is, and then I'll give you mine. Okay. So according to Wikipedia, a public key infrastructure is a set of roles, policies, and procedures needed to create, manage, distribute, use, store, and revoke digital certificates and manage public key encryption. The purpose of a PKI is to facilitate the secure electronic transfer of information for a range of network activities, such as e-commerce, internet banking, and confidential email. It is used for activities where simple passwords are an inadequate authentication method and more rigorous proof is required to confirm the identity of the parties involved in the communication and to validate the information being transferred. Um, so we're going to go through a lot of stuff today. Um, we'll try to put your questions in the, um, in, in the zoom client and, you know, we'll, we'll try to address them, you know, either during this webinar or after. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Um, I got a fair amount of material to go through, it took a lot of time and I apologize for postponing this uh, a month. Um, 
took a, a fair amount of time to basically take all the data that I gathered. I sent some of you guys an email this morning. Hopefully you found it to be value add, uh, jumping off point for additional reading. Okay. So in cryptography, uh, a PKI is an arrangement that binds public keys with respective identities of entities. So for example, like people, organizations, the binding is established through a process of registration and the issuance of certificates at and by certificate authority. Depending on the assurance level of the binding, this may be carried out by an automated process or under human supervision. Okay, um, the PKI role that assures valid and correct registration is called a registration authority. Uh, a registration authority is responsible for accepting requests for digital certificates and authenticating the entity making the request. And a Microsoft PKI, a registration authority is uh, usually called a subordinate CA. Okay. So uh, from a security aspect, uh, PKI helps strengthen the CIA triad, okay? It doesn't do much for availability, but it does do a, a heck of a lot for the integrity of what's being transferred and uh, can help maintain the confidentiality that no one is uh, able to see what you're looking at or the intended um, sender and the recipient, okay? And there's a time and a place for all types of encryption. Uh, applications use tokens in their uh, in their apps, you know, whether that be you know web apps or point of sale um, versus at, at the file and disk level, right? These are all different times that we can use encryption. Both have their place, and you may have a need to encrypt a, a transaction, you know, something in flight, data in flight, or uh, perhaps at rest. There's times for encryption as it relates to compliance. Um, compliance can dictate when, where, how you will encrypt stuff. And stuff, eh, sounds ambiguous, but it's actually, it's good. Because you can do a lot with encryption. You can do a lot with PKI. And we'll talk about some of the infrastructure associated with, uh, with these going forward. Um, you know, compliance and complexity and speed in which you, you want to leverage encryption, they all come into play on determining where you want to encrypt. You might not be able to encrypt if you were. It might not make sense. Um, there's been some stuff in the news recently, and we'll, we'll touch about it a little bit later on about uh, on, on some of the Linux clients on the Debian side, um, how their repository should be hosted via HTTPS versus HTTP, right? So the clear text HTTP is faster, and even though they find all their code uh, with TGP, um, it was determined, eh, you know, from an app get perspective, we'll have to start um, posting that stuff on HTTPS. That'll be a new standard going forward. Okay. Uh, so, you know, in your organization, you may have requirements for data at rest to be encrypted. When is that database at rest? Right. I would say never really. Right. If it's if it's active, it's online. It's it's not at rest. Um, I would say at that point, you want to take a hybrid approach for your databases for maybe encrypting specific fields, right? Um, certainly encrypt your backups, okay? So, so just a couple different examples of where we might actually use encryption. Um, full disk encryption. Full disk encryption is the rage, right? Uh, people take for granted how we do full disk encryption today. Um, so whether it's BitLocker, um, is it backed up with, with proper crypto, is it a password, you know, you may have different requirements um, to protect your full disk encryption. All these, you know, I just gave you a couple examples, we'll go through a little bit more. Um, all of these are good, right, but they add uh, complexity, they add cost, they might slow down, right, and, you know, from a security aspect, uh, I love security. I like. I love least privilege. Um, however, I know this: if I make it so difficult on my end users, they're going to try to circumvent security controls, right? And none of us want that. That that kind of defeats the purpose of good uh, security. So, what does doing PKI look like? Okay. Um, uh, following the, the previous webinar, right? 
I, 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 I focus a lot on policies, right? And people don't want to do policies. They want to touch bare metal. They want to start decrypting. They, they want to do all the technical things. And I say, slow down because a good plan, right? A good set of standards will set you up for success. Okay. Um, you're going to um, have to identify what type of key lengths and approved ciphers and algorithms, you know, that you can use in your organization, right? Could be everything, could be just a few things. Uh, some organizations have to adhere to FIPS and some people don't even know what FIPS is and uh, those standards set forth by the government. And so maybe non-FIPS is acceptable. You might have requirements as it relates to uh, how do you check uh, the certificates that are in scope, right? Uh, you can, you might have a mandate to use OCSP or perhaps, you know, the uh, certificate rev revocation list or the CRIL, okay? You could have um, requirements for attributes, right? So when, when you click on a certificate and you look at it and you say, hey, the issuer is from the state of South Carolina, uh, that's an attribute, right? You may have organization requirements say, um, we need specific ones to be on every certificate, regardless of what type, type of that it is, okay? Policies are important. Uh, how long or how valid, or what's the length of time in which a cert can be valid? You know, set an expiration, every 365, or can we issue specific certs for three years or more? Um, do you have requirements for your subordinates, right? Do you have requirements on your root uh, CA? Um, these are the type of things you want to think about. It's, it's a uh, measure twice, five times, cut once, right? Some of the core stuff when you start implementing PKI, um, it's, it's not impossible to go back and recorrect. It just takes time and effort, okay? So um, th these are kind of policy items that you want to um, keep in mind. Uh, during the last webinar, I gave the example of uh, decrypting traffic, okay? And is that acceptable from an HR perspective? So if any of you guys from an IT perspective how had to battle with HR about, uh, I don't want to call them the good idea fairy, but they might have a legalese approach that wouldn't exactly measure what you think is in the acceptable use policy that hopefully your organization has written. So make sure you get this stuff vetted by them so that all of that is um, totally known and understood. You might have requirements where you can use uh, symmetric and asymmetric keys. Can you use that same key for encryption and decryption? Or do you need to leverage public and private certs? Okay, uh, I'm going fairly quickly and for that I, I kind of apologize. We can deep dive for this for hours in writing a policy. Um, I think the um, one of the first PKI or cryptographic policies that I, I helped write, um, just the policy was over 80 pages. A lot of hard reading, um, not easy reading, but it determined, uh, you know, how the organization will, will leverage cryptology, uh, cryptography, excuse me, and, uh, and implement it on all things, you know, human and uh, information technology, right? And you may have to discuss some of the uh, PKI policy stuff with your, your uh, architects, right? You have infrastructure architects, you have security architects, you have application architects, right? They might look at it a little bit differently. It, it's a good thing to be on the same page here and to um, properly discuss how can we use cryptography in all, all the different areas of say HR and, excuse me, not HR, but in say infrastructure and applications, right? Um, in, you know, you, you combine security, right? And those three areas from an IT perspective, they think differently and how crypto should be leveraged, you know, and how it should be documented. Security guys want to tighten everything down, make it so no traffic flows. That doesn't work from an application perspective where they're thinking about operations, okay? And uh, here's an important one, right? We, we see this regularly. Um, know where your crypto is used, okay? And think about key storage, right? We, we see it regularly where people will put um, crypto objects on a file server. And they might say, hey, we'll, we'll lock it down by an ACL, right? And 
okay, that, that works to a degree, but there's better ways to do it. There's, there's, and this is part of why you're here. There are best practices, okay? And good news or bad news, there is no one size fits all for everything PKI. Uh, you know, so internally we'll discuss about best practices, your organization, your methodology, your ability to scale and support might dictate how you handle PKI. Okay. So if you are comparing yourself, your organization to the Joneses, don't maybe look at it from a maturity model perspective and say, this is how I want to get better, or this is how I want to improve my policies. Okay. Review your policies. They're not a set it and forget it. Okay. Oh man, slides are hard. All right. So does does anybody even really use PKI? And uh, you know, really the the short answer is heck yeah. We use it everywhere, okay? So on your screen are a bunch of uh, bulleted items where there's common use cases for PKI. I'm not going to insult you and read each of them, uh, and you might not have some of those use cases, okay? Um, so smart cards. Not everybody uses smart cards, okay? Uh, you might use um, some other form of two-factor authentication where it's something you have. OK, um, everybody uses website certs, right? You know, especially for out on the Internet, like you're you, you run the risk of, of not having good certs, right? You, you use that. You typically use a third party provider. Um, are you going to do SSL decryption? How are you going to do SSL decryption? Right. Um, SSH. We can use SSH. Uh, we can use certs when validating who we are when we're doing some SSH, okay? Um, emails, other objects where we can say, hey, we're gonna digitally sign something, right? You know, those, those PDFs, you know, you have to, you know, sign and uh, validate who you are. All of this goes back to PKI, okay? And there's a reason why I'm, I am kind of belaboring the point to a bit, uh, degree, okay? Um, disk encryption, uh, sometimes people buy SAN arrays, right, and other types of, uh, single disks. Well, how do you encrypt those disks? Is it software? Is it done at the hardware level? Um, are they self-signed certs? Um, who validates that the crypto that's being leveraged for disk encryption is, is sufficient, right? These are all things to think about. Um, PGP, talked about that. That database, talked about that. Application encryption, sure. Code signing, code signing is hard, right? Makes sense, right? You know, I think uh, I think I read. Uh, forgive me, I don't remember who, what the the body was that published this. That 52% uh, of malware on the endpoint is done via native tools like PowerShell, right? Well, one way to easily you know knock that down quite a bit is to say only uh, allow this code that's signed by my PKI to run. Cool, you know, you you take and whitelisting to the next level and you've really reduced the surface area, okay? So why, why did I just kind of ramble through all of those? Because all of those in themselves are standalone solutions or items that you have to manage, right? Um, if you had a, a good PKI underpinning everything, you know, behind the scenes, uh, that will allow for you to scale and have visibility where your certificates are. All right, visibility is a big deal. We'll talk about KMS in, in, in just a few minutes, okay? All right, so we, we use crypto all the time, right? So in, in the, the, the screenshot right there, I just threw up something in PowerShell where I wanted to look at the hashes of those files, right? Nothing super duper special, all right? Um, hopefully you guys do that. You look at MD5 hashes. I just picked SHA-384, no big deal. Um, you know, the, the next uh, image to the right there, it, it just gives you a, an idea of how symmetric keys work, okay? And that's typically what most people think of when they think of PKI. And it's, you know, there's, a, there's plain text that I'm going to send to a server, 
And before I send it there, I need to encrypt it. I take the public key. I leverage that, um, uh, that plain text. I turn it into ciphertext. And then uh, obviously, conversely, the decryption process happens on the receiving end. Um, so we will talk a little bit, a little bit about in this discussion or this webinar, um, you know, sitting in the middle, right? We, we went through it a fair amount on SSL decryption, right? You sit in the middle. Uh, you decrypt it. Does it look good? Does that traffic coming in and out look, you know, healthy? Is it, does it have good integrity? And then you re-encrypt it back out, okay, that man in the middle. Um, and then ciphers. So the cipher suite is the combination of uh, cryptographic algorithms that are used for key exchange, encryption, and message authentication when performing um, communication in, in SSL or TLS, as shown right in the bottom, right? And that's just a breakdown. That's part of the that that handshake that's going to occur, and we're going to negotiate, and we're going to I'm going to give you a couple examples of how to validate um, what you as the the sender and what the receiver will do with these ciphers. Okay, uh, but just you know, this is just setting the stage. All right, so we see it fairly regularly again that people's keys are all over the place. You know, they could be on your host systems. They could be in your source code. Um, if you can, it makes sense for you to leverage a hardware security module, right? So an HSM, you know, they've been around for a while. Uh, they are the standard for taking your private keys and typically putting there somewhere else, okay? Um, as you can read on here, um, you can store those master keys in, in a separate physically tamper-proof solution, okay? It's not always physical, it could be software-based HSM. Uh, some people might have, this goes back to compliance standards, you may have a requirement that it isn't a physical um, solution where if somebody tampers with it, you know, starts taking a top off of it, it wipes everything from a protection perspective. Uh, certain HSMs, they have the ability to uh, offload some of the SSL creation, right? So those sessions that you're creating for web browsing, if I'm sitting in the middle, you may have the ability to leverage an H HSM to provide that crypto back up to the man in the middle device and back out, um, you know, to take some of the strain off of say a firewall, right? Um, you know, maybe that's a nice feature to have, maybe it's not. Um, basically, uh, applications, right, and I use that term very loosely at, for, at this point, but they can leverage the HSM to take um, certificates or off and on from a HSM, right? They can say, this is John Smith. I validate this John Smith. Keep his keys here, okay? All right. So this, this is where we see HSMs being used. So, you know, in, in this scenario, We've talked about PKI, right? And we take the private keys, right? And we put them on the HSM. So only that, that issuing certificate authority or that whatever type of um, PKI device can pull those private keys off of it, okay? It's, it's, it's safe storage. At the end of the day, it's, it's very safe storage. But it's not the only place that leverages it. You can also leverage it with uh, banks use them all the time, right? Because they're secure. Right, and they say, hey, we'll do a one-to-one -one mapping. Only this particular application can pull this bank data. Okay, we talked a little bit about SSL decryption and um, you know, basically offloading some of that connection. Uh, so DNSSEC, DNSSEC, uh, if, if you've ever had to do it, it's painful, right? And you wanna automate it. But also during the, the, the zone signing and the, the record signing, it takes a fair amount of resources. So depending on, um, for this discussion, I'll just use the word bind. From a bind perspective, the, the horsepower to sign a lot of items in your DNS zone could be resource, so resource intensive that you're actually degrading the ability to provide DNS services to your customers. Right, so from that perspective, you may want to leverage an HSM there to eat some of that pain, okay, and do some of that heavy lifting. Um, cryptocurrency, right? 
what's, you know, hey, everybody wants to get in on, on, on Bitcoin, right? Or they make reference to Bitcoin and how somebody lost all their money in Bitcoin. Why? Because their wallet was available. Um, you can secure it in an HSM, right? You can, you can keep the keys to your kingdom offline, right? And, and make it much more difficult for an intruder to get access to them. At the end of the day, that's what an HSM, HSM does. It gives you flexibility. It gives you, um, you can do it with redundancy, but it also, it, it protects the data much better than say, keeping all your eggs in one basket, right? It's, it's, a, it's a feature device that is meant to provide um, various functions back to you and to your applications, okay? And from the standpoint, if you say, hey, I don't need an HSM, I don't want an HSM, you're entitled to that. But the one thing I would tell you is it, it's an opportunity for you to help people get out of their existing silos, okay? Let's put all those keys to the kingdom in a, in a properly secured place where we can audit it, okay? Uh, where we have visibility, right? And I hate to say this, and we'll talk about best practices as we keep going. Best practices are real. Um, it's in the news fairly regularly how people take their, their private keys and they do something foolish with them, right? Go to Google right now, look up, um, you know, GitHub source code, you know, keys embedded or something like that, right? It happens all the time. That's not, you, you don't want to be on the news for that, okay? So the HSM is, again, is, is an opportunity for you to have that secure repository. Okay, so what is the traditional HSM? Okay, the traditional HSM is, is, is a physical appliance and, uh, you know, kind of goes back to some of those, those use cases I gave you earlier, right? And you see those check boxes and the traditional HSM can do all of those things. And it does them extremely fast, okay? Uh, it's, it's a mature product um, that allows for all of your functions and scalability and geographically dispersed. It, it allows for all of that today. The physical HSM does that. The, um, they typically, typically, if you embed yourself with uh, an HSM provider, there are known solutions for... Uh, your key management services, okay? So KMS, they are, um, they help make the management of the objects stored inside the HSM easier, okay? Um, pretty straightforward, something to think about. And we'll, we'll talk about KMS a little bit more as we keep going. You also have the ability, here's a big one, um, APIs. HSMs allow, they for support of uh, PKCS number 11, uh, Microsoft's cryptographic application programming language, um, the cryptographic uh, API next generation, Java cryptography architectures, Java cryptography extensions, and other APIs, right? You say, wow, what does this have to do with me? I'm not an application developer. That's great. You might need the application developer to properly be able to write back to the HSM. All of these things take place, right? So the traditional HSM um, upfront time um, might take a little bit longer to get up and running. It might cost some money. You might have to rack and stack it. You'll have to go through your compliance um, feature set. It's it's got a, the largest feature set, and it is the fastest. Okay, um, so part of the information, and I'll go, I'll drop to it in just a few minutes, but. Uh, where I compare some cloud and some physical HSMs. Um, cloud HSMs are great, right? And let's, here, let's, let's move to it. So cloud HSMs are great. They're not the same as a physical. They do not offer all of the same use cases today. They might in the future, but they do not today, okay? Um, they are typically... Uh, at this point, they're more geared towards um, applications, right, and storing of of keys related to applications versus, say, the security product. So, one of the reasons that um, I struggled with getting this webinar to you guys was because I was like, well, you know, we we do standalone HSMs today. 
I wanted to bring to you and say, hey, let's do HSM in the cloud, right? Let's show you what that looks like from a security tool perspective, okay? And at this moment, there is not a solution that I could find natively. Like, I'm not going to say there's not ways to hand jam or whatever, but I couldn't find supported ways for your security tools to leverage cloud HSMs, okay? Um, talked with Palo. I'm just using Palo as an example. Uh, talked with Palo Alto from the standpoint of, you know, you have, you know, virtual firewalls, you know, sit in Azure, sit in uh, GPCS or Google. They sit in AWS. They sit in all these different places. Can I leverage a cloud HSM? And at this point, the answer is no. It's, it's, it's on the roadmap, okay? I went to, and just, you know, not to feel like I'm beating up on Palo Alto, I went to Azure, right? And I, I talked to the um, program managers for Azure. I said, okay, cool. You guys have, I, I would prefer to leverage a proper security tool that I know and trust, aka a Palo Alto firewall. Can I leverage an HSM in your environment? And they said, sure, sure you can. They have the ability, right? And I'll, I'll drop down to this in just a second um, for, to present to you on your, on your private network, a physical HSM. Okay, great. Do you have the ability to do something like that using a, your cloud HSM? Because they have a cloud HSM offering as well. The answer was no. Same thing happened to AWS and with Google. You know, it's, all these things were roadmap items, okay? So when it comes to the cloud HSM, something to think about is if you're in the cloud, I, I kind of, you know, I'm a fan of saying you, you bought into that cloud uh, ecosystem, support that ecosystem. PKI is hard. You might want to leverage the offerings that are provided by your cloud provider. Okay, uh, it might make troubleshooting that much easier and logging of data and auditing that much easier. Okay, so let me let me digress for a moment. And here is my spreadsheet. Hopefully everybody can see my spreadsheet. Um, I took some time to go through the various providers. You know, whether it's Microsoft or Jamalto, um, Azure, AWS. Um, you know, and say, hey, what do you guys do from a HSM perspective, right? You know, tell me some of the goodness. And, you know, the data I captured, it could already be old. It could be a great starting point for you, right? It could be just awesome to know, you know, um, I want to know just about how scaling works, right? Are you geo aware? Are you non geo aware? Uh, how quickly can you um, do some of the, the transactions, right? And obviously, what's the cost? Right. Um, so Microsoft still gives you the ability to have a physical safe net device. Uh, AWS, if you look through, has a where is it at? They've got an old uh, classic solution where they allow you, you know, kind of similar to Azure to have an upfront cost of five grand and then you pay an hourly rate to leverage a physical HSM. OK, really good stuff. Um, the world is your oyster. You have tons of options here. My, my general thing that I would say to you is a lot of the HSMs, especially in the cloud, they don't have security tools in mind. Okay. So that might be something to keep an eye out on. And, you know, to a degree that that stinks for this webinar, because that's really what I wanted to show you. That was the primary thing. And, um, you know, so we did HSMs in over the internet. That's not the same thing as using a cloud resource. It's 2019, cloud all the things. And that's that's really what I wanted to present to you guys. Okay. Hey, bro, can, so, can you bring that, that spreadsheet back up real quick? Yeah. I, I, this is something I just want to mention to everyone. So Carl is a very, very detailed security architect. He's a guy that goes out and does his homework, does his research, and, and makes sure that, that he's weighing all options. If you do not get anything else out of this webinar, this spreadsheet is the magic. And everyone who registered got this spreadsheet. And this webinar will be on YouTube, just like all of our other webinars. And we will have links to where you can access this spreadsheet. But this is a point in time stamp of where our industry is from a cloud HSM perspective. So 
You know, like Carl said, we don't really have a, uh, there, there's not a way to do it uh, when you look at security devices. So, you know, and Carl's probably going to talk about this in a minute, but a lot of their HSM solutions are more geared towards the, you know, application development and, you know, database tokenization and, and things of that nature, right? Because just like Carl hit on a second ago, there's a lot of other use cases. But as it relates to security devices and being able to decrypt data, the industry has a little bit of catch up to do. And, and one other piece of good news is Carl did us all a favor and he put in feature requests all over the place. So hopefully we will see this coming. And, and if and when we do, we will be prepared to put together another webinar update to this and, and educate everyone on that. Yep. <clears throat> uh, so what, one of the other things that I thought was pretty cool was uh, and, and the details are in here. Some of this is how I interpreted data, how I interpreted conversations. I thought RBAC was interesting. Uh, and on the cloud side, some of the cloud providers had more granular RBAC. Um, you know, some of them like, you know, so you have the ability with those physical safe net devices to leverage a PED. Uh, you could do SSH from afar. You can control it as if you it was on-prem pretty cool stuff, right? So depending on what your requirements are, you know, the world is your oyster. There are tons of options. And, uh, you know, so you could tie it into your existing um, authentication structure. You can have standalone. You can do M of N checkouts and or M of N um, requirements to perform certain functions on an HSM. Really cool stuff. You know, I'm trying not to super duper rush through this. Um, I'm, I'm really not, but I'm also trying to keep you engaged. The details that go into how to decide all things cryptography, uh, all things PKI, all things HSM, they all relate. They all relate back to your, again, back to your applications. Who do you have to support? How long do you have to support them? Uh, all of that comes into play here. All this stuff is cool. Good stuff. Um, so, so, so you have all these keys and they are out on your HSM. What do we do with them, right? Um, so key management solutions allow you to, I think of them as like entitlement management workflow, right? Um, they help you administer and keep an eye on um, everything that is within the HSM. Right, and they can kind of be that middleman comic correct me, but I think of them as the standpoint of uh, they provide you with the ability to manage your workflow. It could be a manual administrative effort, it can be a um, application effort. you know let me take things in and out of the vault, if you will, right uh, There are some that allow you to bring your own keys right from you know HSM provider A and bring them to HSM provider B right, and automate that, right? These are good things about KMS. You can, uh, like I said, you can hand jam them, right? So for every, everybody on the phone who's got, you know, that online root CA, um, I would ask you, when was the last time you did clean up on it? How do you do clean up on it? Do you go into it and just look at the store and say, oh, I think these have expired. Let's just delete them. That's an option, right? Um, there's a couple of examples right there that you may want to think about as well on the right hand side of the screen and just and probably try to mature and establish better workflows as you leverage cryptography more and more. Uh, what else? So I was really impressed with some of the cloud providers, um, some of the ability to do like automatic key rotations and um, how they could scale geographic wise uh, just natively. I thought that was really cool. Um, you know, just because I keep, you know, saying, I think it's cool from the standpoint, uh, I, I'm more familiar with traditional HSMs, right? That's what I have more experience in. I think it was pretty cool. So, for example, you could have um, a region in, in AWS and you can front end your, your HSM with a load balancer, right? And, um, you know, same thing on the key side. Um, you can access that load balancer. You got all those HSMs behind it. You can say, I think it had like up to like per instance, it was like 32 um, HSMs, you know, on their software based HSMs. And you're like, wow, that's a lot. You should have a lot of throughput. You may have the ability to write more, but really those are replicas, 
right? So if you have a, a fair amount of um, writes, you know, and even reads for that matter, you, you may have to really pay attention to um, your KMS as well as the HSM solution that you do per, that you go end up using. That doesn't mean you can't have more than one. Um, just giving you that food for thought. All right, I beat you guys up over the head over the last webinar. Test, 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 and test some more, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheels for all of this stuff, okay, as it relates to cryptography. Um, your, your trusty vendor is gonna, you know, your, your OEM is gonna give you some best practices, okay? So right here, right, let's see if I can make it so you can actually read it a little bit. Hopefully that works. Palo Alto says, look, this is our suggested best practices for our next generation firewall, right? So as it comes to your gateways, um, we want you to do some of the following things. Whoops, hold on. Let's go back to decrypting traffic, right? All these things apply, but I'm just gonna focus on decrypting traffic, but they're giving you best practices. You say, that's great, Carl, why, why should I care about that? You care because, um, you got to get started somewhere, right? And, you know, whether it's the compliance sword or you're just going to go from the standpoint of, I don't know where to get started, this is a great reference point. And if you're not sure, you know, should I have this one checkbox, right? Should I block sessions with expired certs, right? This kind of goes back to your policies, right? Do I want my, my end users connecting to websites with expired certificates? I don't know what the answer is. Right, your organization might say, "Man, I don't want to hear. I'm at the help desk. I don't want to hear from an end user because they they couldn't get to a website." Totally valid approach. Not the most mature approach, but it's a valid approach. I get it. Um, you might have to block specific types of traffic with bad certs, okay? And then say, "What is a bad cert?" Okay, a bad cert might be from somebody who is an untrusted issuer. Right. So just like your, you know, we used the example back in the last webinar of the, the Microsoft store, uh, excuse me, the certificate store. Inside of that was it started with Microsoft populating it. You can remove all the, the, the roots and intermediates that they gave you. You can add your own. You can curtail it to your liking. Palo Alto does the same thing here. They won't, they'll say, uh, don't we don't know who issued this cert. And as a result, block that session. OK, um, I know you guys can read, so I'm not going to go through each of these. Right. But all of this makes sense. This remember this whole cipher thing. OK, well, we'll determine what ciphers are in a moment, like which ones are supported or trusted. And then based on that, I want to allow that 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 communication to come through. Right. So over here, let's scroll over just a little bit more. Do I want to allow algorithms to be built, uh, sessions to be built off of weak algorithms? Maybe, maybe not, right? And you say, there, there's too many what ifs, right? There's a lot of things that are in scope for the appropriate, and I do air quotes, appropriate building of sessions, okay? So in this scenario, we're talking about decryption. Um, how do we want our, end users or our inbound servers, you know, what kind of uh, crypto are we going to mandate that that session establish? You might say, I, I don't care. That's true. You might not care. But, you know, for some of the weaker stuff, right, you can, if, if, if somebody gets a copy of it offline, they can break it. They can break into it and they can see the traffic. That's probably not the desired intent of having encrypted traffic. Remember, it's, it's part of that, that CIA triad was that confidentiality that you are only talking to, you know, uh, whoever on the other end, and that session has integrity, okay? All of these are, are appropriate here. So you have the ability right out of the gate to have a good starting point from your OEM. In this scenario, I, I chose Palo Alto. Uh, they have good documentation. This documentation is tried and true. You can talk to other people. This is not um, this is not documentation where um, it was made up on the fly, right? And 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 you say why why are you bringing that up? And I, I'm actually gonna have to go back to my 
presentation for a second. One of the other things I tried to do with the HSM, right, was to, to open source things and to just show you, hey, you're not dependent upon closed source solutions. You're not dependent upon Palo Alto. You're not dependent upon SourceFire. You're not dependent upon SafeNet, right? Uh, I didn't find great solutions, and I'm sure I'll get, you know, a couple, you know, comments and or email sent my way where, nope, you're wrong. Um, I didn't find it. Uh, when I talked to all the, the the COTS HSM providers, I said, you know, I'm looking for any security tool that you guys can say that leverages your HSM. Open source, closed source, I don't care. Uh, and there wasn't a lot. Um, squid proxies, you know, that, that was my first go-to on the open source side. They don't. You can do man in the middle, but they don't leverage an HSM to do it. Okay. So here you go. So I, I kind of gave you some spiel about the OEM side. So now I say, okay, you've thrown so many acronyms, uh, so much crypto jargon. How do I get started, right? How do I answer some of the questions that you keep posing to me that I have to have a plan, a policy for, right? Let's see, where is my browser? All right, cool, good news. Uh, SL Labs, they give you some solutions. I'll go through a couple of them right here, right now. And um, URLs and stuff will be at the end of the slide. So, I mean, you can try to write them down. I'm good either way. Right here, right, um, I can go back to knowing what my standards are, my standard web browser, my standard OS, okay? These, these, this comes back to actually having standards and it's important. We're going to write policies. We're going to put implement. We're going to implement controls based on those standards. Okay. So if Internet Explorer is your standard, great. Love it. Live it. It's all good. If Chrome is your standard, great. No problem. Same thing for Firefox. If they are all your standard, you may want to go through the same thing here. So all I did, right, is I just want to look at the capabilities of this browser. Nothing special, right? And there's not a. I would like to say there's not a right or wrong. There actually is. Right, just big picture. You know, do all does it support all of these protocols? That's probably not great, right? Uh, TLS 1.2 is the standard. 1.3 is coming up. Thanks, Google. No problem. Okay, here we go. We're back to Cipher Suites, right? Here's the preference that this browser that we've leveraged um, will try to negotiate with. Is that acceptable? You can change Cipher Suite uh, orders, right? Um, this is something that you're going to have to think about. Do you have the resources on the endpoint, the CPU, right? Think about this to basically make it uh, establish longer key lengths and have stronger crypto when binding to specific types of um, recipient sources, right? That web server, if you will. These are all things you're going to have to think about right now and going forward. Okay. Uh, scrolling down a little bit more. Tell me a little bit more about the protocols. Great. Uh, all this you might have to adhere to from a compliance perspective. You may not. Okay. You know, how does this browser handle this? This is great. Not so much PKI based, but pretty important stuff. Okay. Wonderful. Great. I know what's on my endpoint. Well, good. Now let's, let's focus on that, that server, right? That web server on the recipient end. Here we go, we can throw in host name in here, and from there, we can take a look at how it presents its crypto, right? So in here, I used our website, okay? Um, nothing, you can put in your own, you can put in Google, knock yourself out, but get an idea of how the websites you or your users are going to, how they behave, how they act, and what they support and don't support. Okay, so so here we can look at all the all the certs, right? We can look at the certificate attributes and what they're presenting, and um, you might have to say, you know, SHA-256 with RSA for an algorithm is is strong, it's good, uh, but maybe SHA-1 is not acceptable, and you might want to validate that sooner rather than putting in a policy that is not allowed, or, or yeah, that came out right. So all of these things come into play. 
you know, that you'll want to look at. I'm not saying you can do this for all your websites that your users go to. I'm not. But I'm sure you have a top 10. You know, you have, air quotes, the supported websites. You know, if somebody finds some off-the-wall one, congratulations. But there are certain ones, your, your trusted trading partners. You know, maybe you handle crypto with those differently. And, you know, this is a good way to get information crypto-wise on those receiving uh, websites. Uh, additional information on the certificate. Right down here. Great. Protocol supported. We're back to Cypher Suites, right? So it's a negotiation of, I want to talk to you, uh, server, and the server says, cool. This is the order in which I would like to talk to you in. And sometimes the client demands it a specific way, and you can hard code your server to say, nope, congratulations, I'm not using weak ciphers. I'm only using strong ones, right? This is the kind of thing that you should be looking for as it relates to cryptography in your environment. And different maturities of organizations will handle this differently. You might not look at that at all. You know, you might say, I really care about this, and I will mature all my solutions uh, around this. Uh, here you go. How do all the different devices that may or may not talk to this website behave, right? All that's right here. You know, they made this pretty easy for me. Um, I'm not an application developer, but I think that's pretty awesome that you have all the different versions of browsers um, and OSs right there. That's pretty cool, right? Um, let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, you've got some... Um, vulnerability stuff as far as, hey, what may or may not be uh, open on the receiving end. This is not the end-all be-all. Like if you guys ever do an unauthenticated uh, NESA scan, oh man, you have all these vulnerabilities. Well, you might actually try to exploit them, but it's a good starting point, right? Um, you know, trust but verify, but this, this, is, this is really good uh, information. And uh, I, hopefully the price that I told you is great, right? It's free. Not only is it free, you can, let's move on to my next tab. You have the ability here to come back and forgive me for not being at the top of my webpage. Um, Pulse allows you the ability to, uh, it, it goes out and scans the internet, right? And it says, this is what we see out there, right? If you're not sure, yeah, you know, or maybe you, I was thinking about Shodan, Maybe you want something a little bit more reputable on the crypto front to see how the internet is looking. This is a good dashboard, right? Uh, we all, you know, snicker or joke about the the dashboards that are out there. This is pretty good data, right? You might not have this open uh, all the time, but you might be looking for, you know, if somebody says, "Hey, you know, um, we want to have, you know." small keys and we, we want small keys on, on the internet from the standpoint of it'll make our application appear to be faster. That's cool. That's your, your prerogative. Uh, however, if you look at your peers, your peers do not do that, right? And by peers, I just mean other people who are forward facing on the internet. There are all kinds, obviously, uh, the majority of folks run a 2048 bit key. Okay. Um, just, just more good info, okay? Um, I'm not going to go into each one, but I think it's pretty awesome, right? And this is all free. You can deep dive into it. Um, you know, common, common vulnerabilities. How many sites have common vulnerabilities? Um, it's pretty awesome, right? So do you want to be part of that? You can go back and look at your sites. But if you have an idea, like if a new vulnerability comes out and you're getting beaten up, you know, hey, you know, we're we're still vulnerable to Heartbleed 9.0. Well, guess what? So is 99.9% .9 of the internet. Let's let's curb the enthusiasm and plan out a remediation a little bit better. But if you are less than 1% that is vulnerable, you might say, everybody else has figured this out. Um, there might be something horrifically wrong with my um, the methodology in which I'm remediating. Right? Hopefully that makes sense or is helpful. All right, what else? More slides, more content. Great, you've implemented SSL decrypt. But in this scenario, right, here's on my Palo, I am not properly talking. It should be green right here. Okay, status is red, red is bad. Um, 
you know, here you go. I can run the CLI. I can automate the CLI. Is the master key on the HSM? No, that's not good. That is not the expected thing, uh, assuming that we put it out on the HSM. Perhaps on the HSM, you could run this command right here if there is a uh, a NAT in place and the NAT and the HSM can't validate the firewall coming into it, right? You can turn that IP check off on the HSM. Uh, another feature on the HSM is that it only allows for specific devices to connect to it, kind of like a IP tables, ACL, if you will. Okay. Right over here, typical browser stuff. You probably can't read it. Trust me when I say it is simply, a, you know, going to weather.gov. Um, this is what the certificate would look like if the end user were to click on it, right? And you might say that's acceptable or not. Just this is what the end user sees, right? This, this box right here that my mouse is going through, this is what we see on the Palo side. We see that traffic is being decrypted. We see on this particular packet that, yes, it has the decrypted flag. Yep, we can validate that. We know that the IP address for weather.gov is this. And um, based on that, here is the NATed IP for my uh, outbound traffic. And same thing here on the search. But that's basically it, right? These are the kind of things that you're going to want to look for, right? And sometimes these say no, right? And you might say, I want to know why I'm not decrypting. And this might help you troubleshoot. And you might have to get a little bit more granular and look at the certificate that's being presented. This is uh, off of the cache, off of the firewall itself, right? You could run this command. It has a fair amount of output, especially if you have a ton of certs um, that the, the firewall is holding onto. I just put some stuff in red as to how it's pertinent relating back up towards what the user sees and what the, the firewall admin sees via the GUI. Okay, that's that's basically all that's supposed to be, right? Get you thinking about these things, you know, tools to help you do your job, troubleshoot, if you will. All right, so you you implemented SL decryption, and guess what? Things are not happy. So here's a great example. Here's an example on a Debian-based machine, um, Ubuntu, and uh, we did an apt update, and guess what? I can't. I can't validate the uh, stores on the on the destination end because there's crypto involved and there's an issue with the validation of the man in the middle um, certificate. Okay, so just like we went through in the in the um, previous webinar, right, where there are appropriate certificate stores or trusted uh, methodologies per your app per your OS, um, you're going to have to do the same thing here in this scenario so that this machine can do the same update to validate what's in the repository against its um, installed apps and validate that they're good to go or not. Either one is acceptable, but um, you know, thank no, you just the standpoint, standpoint of, of that'll give that'll you the ability, the ability to, to properly update, update the endpoint. endpoint. Hey Carl, I'm going to jump in for one sec. Everyone, yeah, this, yeah. Uh, Carl warned me of this before we got into the webinar. He said, Leo, this is one I may run 15 minutes over on, but to get through the content that's needed, it's necessary. So if anyone has to drop off, I encourage you to go to YouTube later. We'll have this out on the YouTube channel once again. Um, Three-part series. This is the first of a three-part series, so we're going we're gonna to be covering a lot here. Um, Carl, good to go. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, so, and I, I mean, honestly, prepping for all this, many, many hours. It may not always appear that many, many hours went into it. Lots of it did. Lots of good use cases, right? Lots of good things, you know, so whether it was a Debian or a Relbox, you know, these are ways to get certs um, hand jammed into a store. These are ways to automate them. Now, these are the things that I've learned, you know, during some of these processes and to make it sustainable. But, all right, so my slide kind of took off for me. You know, there's, you know, there's many ways to skin this cat to look at encrypted traffic and to inspect encrypted traffic, right? So my, my first item is, um, you know, you, you spend a bunch of money on that IDS IPS, right? That could also be a Palo Alto. Put the search there, inbound, outbound connections, right? Get that visibility. 
A lot of times folks will have standalone proxy servers. Do it there. Now, these are common places. You can offload that, that proxy traffic, right? Um, what else? Um, big fan of Gigamon, right? So I talked about this in the previous uh, webinar, but from the standpoint of traffic aggregators, see a lot of traffic, you might want to decrypt it in one place. You know, Palo can do this too, but um, maybe from a workflow perspective, the core of my network is more so like a Gigamon, and then I can offload that decrypted traffic one time to many devices or have rules based on that type of traffic, what I do with it, kind of traffic hop, if you will, right? These are things that you can think about. Uh, you can offload encrypted traffic into standalone tools, totally fine. And the last one, remember there's the client and the side, right? They, uh, both of them are pretty important for um, the encryption process of traffic. You can just, you know, if you can get the traffic, you can get the keys off of the endpoint, right? There's, I've got a URL at the end of this, um, this slide deck. You can do it there. Certainly not scalable, but from a learning perspective, um, pretty cool, right? Um, just something to think about, right? And again, I mean, we're, I, I keep going back to testing. Testing is super duper important, right? Walk, you know, crawl, walk, run. You know, and even then, think about how you're going to implement this. What's a safe strategy? You know, let's let's vet this. Let me help you vet. Let some of our other network engineers vet the way you're going to do it. Um, testing, testing, testing. All right. So, Leo, um, are there any questions that have queued up? Bear with me. I'm just running through the chat window here. I don't see the chat window. I would just kind of lose it. Problem with the chat windows, you got to kind of scroll through it. Don, I know Don, Donnie's been kind of working through the questions. Donnie, have you documented them as we're going here? Yeah, guys. A couple questions were, you know, are there previous presentations going to be available? Yes, I'll send it to you guys after. Um, Andy Shook had a great question. Can you give a use case and or justification to utilize an on-prem HSM? Also, when does using an HS HSM not make sense? So the first question is, can you give a use case or justification to utilize an on-prem HSM? Yeah, so the the physical on-prem HSM is typically gonna be super, super fast comparatively and much more feature rich than say the, the, the today's cloud solutions. So you might, have, depending on your application needs, you might have to leverage uh, the traditional HSM, right? Um, the only one, Carl, you found through the course of your, your research here is, right, if we want to be using an HSM to integrate with security devices for, for decryption, mm -hmm. that's our only option, I mean. Yep, for, for on the security side. Uh, the cloud solutions for HSM are super awesome and super mature uh, crypto-wise for apps and those APIs, you know, they have even even... You know, whether it's your native AWS and Azure or the third party uh, sales and uh, safe nets, they have good posted crypto to, to allow for that secure transactions back to their HSMs. Just keep in mind, you may have a bottleneck of the, uh, excuse me, the internet versus your LAN. And so also, uh, all, all, a lot of the previous content is out on our and uh, so there's there's a survey. If you could do the survey, that would be great. I promise you, it's cozy. Uh, pull it out if you have additional info or additional questions. Please do it. Um, were there any more, Donnie or Leo? No, I think we answered them all in the chat. I think I may have been, I don't know if I cut, cut out or you cut out a little bit there, Carl, when you were going through the t-shirt. But yeah, we, you know, I'll just reset it in case it was you. Got the survey out there, the links here. 
Um, if any, if you don't, you don't have time to write it down, you're driving, email us at info at EITS.com. We'll, we'll shoot you a link to the survey and anyone that fills out the survey, we're giving away this free shirt. Um, the only other one I think we had as far as questions was, um, mm -hmm. is there a scenario where you wouldn't use an HSM? Okay. Not really. However, to the, the short answer is yes, you, you put you might not have the capital to do so, right? You might not have the money. You might not have the ability to support it. That would be it. I mean, it certainly is not ideal. And you, you might be okay with the risk of keeping all of your keys in one place. So one of the risks with doing that though, right? So a lot of folks, what we see is we'll have an online route, right? And that online route, um, is always available it's on the internet, uh, not on the internet, excuse me, hopefully it's not on the internet. Internally, it's, it's publishing keys and, and, and providing that service to your internal environment. Should your internal environment get breached, you know, everybody thinks I'm going to go after AD. Well, why not go after your online route and steal all your certs? And now, and not even that, I can impersonate you and you'll never know. You know, so this is a good thought. How about any, anything else? I think that's it. Awesome. Everybody for joining. Hopefully you guys got some uh, at the time. And uh, again, as Leo said, if there's any info at EIT, I appreciate it.